Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. No one can ever forget the shock and horror of the first nuclear bomb produced by World War II. Now we realize that wars generate new and unwelcome surprises, dilemmas, which we must face and solve. As a rule, they're ugly problems. But there was a war in the not-so-distant future that sprang a bomb which might have been the salvation and delight of mankind if the top brass had known how to handle it. Lady Leela, I cannot thank you enough for this glorious night. I adore you. There is no one like you in all Rome. There is nothing I would not do for you. You do anything except tell me the truth. Tell the truth. I, I don't understand. You have tricked your way into my lascivious Roman boudoir. You are not Ben Hur. You are Julius Caesar in disguise. Uh, how did you know? The tenth legion squealed on you. They owe me lots of favors. Caesar, you will live to rule this day. Beware the Ides of March. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Now You See Them, Now You Don't, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Alfred Bester and stars Robert Dryden and Leon Janney. It is sponsored in part by the Greyhound Ameripass and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. <laughs> Professor Harry Scrim is serving 20 years hard labor in Alcatraz, which was reactivated for the conscientious objectors to World War V. This is his story to tell because Dr. Scrim solved the mystery of the fantastic bombshell which burst on the Western world in the year 2175. This one wasn't the last war or the war to end wars. They didn't even call it WW5. No, it was, quote, the war for the American dream, end quote. General Harp invented that slogan and repeated it over and over again. My fellow Americans, this great nation of ours is not fighting for money or power or conquest. We are fighting to bring the American dream to the free nations of the world. There are fighting generals, political generals, and public relations generals who have to sell a war to the consumer. <laughs> U.B. Harp was a great salesman. My fellow Americans, we are fighting solely for the American dream. We are fighting for the American meaning of civilization for art, for poetry, for culture, for the only things worth fighting for. The American dream is the better things in life which must not disappear from the free world. Oh, he sold the war for the American dream and we fought. General Harp asked for 10,000 intercontinental missiles. Thousand were delivered to the enemy. And the enemy returned the compliment. Most of our cities were destroyed. Hmm. New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, St. Louis, Washington. Thank heavens we moved the government to Colorado. Cleveland, Atlanta. Most of the pride of America. But we can't despair. 
That's not the American dream. Yes, General Harp. Get me a thousand mining engineers. One thousand. Yes, sir. Brief them. Their mission to design and supervise the construction of a hundred underground cities. Yes, General Harp. Are we going into hiding? Never. We will carry on as before. I also require 500 sanitation experts, 500 managers, communication chiefs, and personnel specialists. Yes, General Harp. I, uh... Excuse me, sir. Yes, yes, what is it? I've been relaying your requests by telex as you ordered. Good, very efficient. The replies are coming in. Yes? Well, sir, the country doesn't seem to be able to meet your quota for technical experts. They don't know what to do. They don't, eh? <laughs> I'll tell them. Book me for a speech to the National Association of American Universities tomorrow. These long hair intellectuals need a lesson. The universities trained and delivered the hardened and sharpened experts that General Harp demanded. The entire nation became a hardened and sharpened army of specialists to win the war for the American dream. But the American dream wasn't fulfilled on any of the seven fronts where millions of men and women were locked in bitter combat. No, it came to life in Ward J of the military hospital. General Hobbs sent for me, Major? No, I sent for you, Captain Edville. Oh, why, Major? Because I don't want to bother the General with details. About these reports from St. Albans Hospital. But I'm not attached to St. Albans, Major. You will be now. There's something funny going on there, and intelligence recommends you as a reliable expert in psychotherapy. Oh, thank you, Major. It's a question of morale. Something's gone sour at St. Albans. Ward J is a mystery. Ward J? Well, there's no J classification in military hospitals. That's the start of the mystery. Now here's the rest. The ward is kept locked up. No patients are permitted to leave or enter. Hmm, that's odd. Staff doctors have been seen entering and leaving, and they all look bewildered and absolutely flabbergasted. Oh, well, that can happen to the best physicians. Cleaning women who have been in Ward J have been gossiping. They say that none of the beds look used. Oh? The kitchen staff has been gossiping. They say that food trays go into Ward J three times a day and come out untouched. There's no one in Ward J? There must be someone, Captain Edsel. One of the paramedics reported passing the locked doors and hearing singing inside. Yeah, uh, singing? He was vague about it. Well, what do the staff physicians say? Nothing, Captain Edsel. Obviously, they're afraid to talk. Well, why? What, what, what could it possibly be? That's why I've taken it upon myself to request your transfer to St. Albans. The hospital is in a ferment. Now, you know how sick people can fly into passions. Morale is deteriorating. General Harp cannot, repeat, cannot be plagued by this. Captain Edsel, go into St. Albans and find out what the devil is going on in Ward J. <laughs> Captain Edsel reporting. Go ahead. Percentage of recoveries at St. Albans falling off. Malingering is set in. Suggest permission to order staff shakeup. Anything on Ward J? No, uh, nothing yet. Have you inspected Ward J? Affirmative. Exactly as gossip has reported. Statements from the staff. They refuse to talk. They're afraid to talk. That's why I urge shakeup. Roger. We'll assign new Surgeon General to St. Albans. <laughs> Captain Edsel reporting. Go ahead. The uh, new chief is doing no good. St. Albans is close to open mutiny. On account of Ward J. Oh, yeah, that's the plague spot. And what's the plague, Captain? Any idea yet? Well, I've been in and out of Ward J for weeks, and I'm beginning to figure it out. Yes, go on. Well, it's too soon to report, mostly because I... I can't believe the evidence. What evidence? Oh, and you won't believe it either. Captain Edsel... What evidence? Report. This is an order. Respectfully rejected, Major. I'm taking no chances on a Section 8 discharge. I have read your report, Major. Most explicit and mystifying. 
This captain you sent to investigate War J. Captain Edsel, sir. Psychotherapist. Expert. Good. This captain has suddenly stopped reporting to you about War J. Yes, General. But the situation must be remedied? Yes, General. St. Albans is in a ferment. I think he's on to something he's afraid to talk about. What? Damned if I know. Oh, excuse me, sir. You know my slogan. A job for every man and every man on the job. This Edsel is not doing his job. Get him. How, sir? In our fight for the American dream, we must not ignore those who have already suffered for our ideal. Send a squad of MPs and drag Edsel to me by the scruff of the neck. Now, look here, Captain Edsel. We're all of us tools today, hardened and sharpened to do a specific job. You know my motto. A job for everyone and everyone on the job. Yes, General. Now, the Major sent you into St. Albans to find out what is going on in this Ward J, which is getting the hospital up tight. Yes, General. All of a sudden, you cut off communications. Why? Well, sir, I... I, I uh, if you, uh, no one will believe me. Let's take it from the top. Are there patients in Ward J? Oh, yes, sir. Ten women and fourteen men. Then it isn't a spook ward, like the reports are saying. No, sir. All right. So they've got these 24 crocs in Ward J. Their job's to get well and go back to the fight. The hospital's job is to get them shaped up. Why the morale fuss? Well, sir, because St. Albans keeps the ward locked. I know, it's in the reports. Why? To keep the patients in, General. Keep them in? What do you mean? Are they trying to bust out? Are they dangerous, violent, or something? Well, well uh, uh, no, sir. They're not not violent, not 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 dangerous. Then why? Uh, I'm afraid to tell you, sir. I'll make it easier for you. What about that J classification? I checked with a filing expert from the medical corps, and there is no J classification in our hospitals. From A to I takes care of all war wounds. Left arm amputees, right arm amputees, left leg, right leg, radiation burns, busted gut, crunched heads, and so on. Oh, yes, sir, I know that. Then what's the J class? Uh, well, sir, you, you see that the staff invented the J class for something uh, special. They're, uh, uh, they're shock cases, uh, blanked out, almost catatonic, slow pulse, slow respiration. You've examined them? Oh, yes, sir, as often as I get the chance. What the devil does that mean? Uh, well, you... Uh, oh, wait a minute. So, uh, let me just explain. See, uh -huh. they, they don't eat and they don't sleep. Never? Well, not in this hospital. Uh, n never. And why don't they die? I mean, you can't go without food and sleep. We don't know, General. They just disappear, sir. D vanish. D they disappear? Right in front of your eyes? Uh, yes, sir. Now you see them, now you don't. <laughs> I mean, uh, they disappear with a kind of a pop, like a cork being pulled out of a champagne bottle. And now you know why we're afraid to report it. Good Lord. Oh, I've seen it over and over again, sir. They'll be in Ward J, sitting on a bed, or standing around, making the, the strange noises that shock cases make. One minute you see them, and the next minute you don't. Sometimes there's two dozen in war, Jay, and other times none. They disappear and reappear without rhyme or reason, General. I don't believe you. They disappear, sir. They disappear. No one will believe you. General, they disappear. All right, all right. At ease, Captain. Bring me three cases and prove it. Twenty-four men and women in Ward J of St. Albans Military Hospital. All shock casualties of a future war. They disappear and reappear with the pop of a champagne cork, without rhyme or reason. If this brand new combat injury of World War V has any meaning, what is it? Act Two may tell us. Do you remember this old rhyme? The other day upon the stair, I saw a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. My God, I wish he'd go away. 
Yes, it's amusing nonsense. But now we're going to find out whether it really is nonsense. And if it's not, where the little man goes when he goes away. Hello, operator. This is Nathan Riley in the penthouse. Uh, get me Diamond Jim Brady and put in a call to Detroit, Michigan. I want to talk to a youngster who runs a bicycle repair shop. Name of Henry Ford. That's right. Hello. Jim. It's Nat Riley. How are all the diamonds today? Uh-huh. Listen, Jim, that 10,000 I'm betting on Gentleman Jim against John L. Sullivan, I want to parlay the payoff. What? Oh, I'll win, all right. Get me down for the short end of the Truman-Dewey election. Uh-huh. I'll take Truman for president at 7 to 5 against. Yeah, I know. I'm always taking the short end, but they always come in, don't they? I'm also taking Notre Dame over Army. And bet the Mets to take the pennant and the series. Right, Jim. Bye. A love to all the diamonds. Come in, it's open. Ah, breakfast. Just wheel the table out on the terrace. Thanks. Hello? Oh, the Detroit call to Henry Ford? Put him on. Hello, good morning, Henry. Uh, you don't know me, so I'd better introduce myself. My name's Riley. Nathan Riley, and I'm an investor. Yeah, that's right. Now, Henry, I heard some talk about a crazy new invention you've got in your bicycle place. I'll invest 200000 Yes, you heard me, 200000 I'll mail you a draft on Johnny P. Morgan's trust today. No, no thanks. We're going to go a long way together. Bye. <sighs> this is the life. It's great here. Just great. What a difference from St. Albans. I really ought to go back to the ward for a last goodbye. I'm going to miss some of those other poor crips. <laughs> That's Private Riley. Shoot him, quick. Hold the syringe. And hold on to him. Got a light, Ben-Hur? Yes, Lady Leela. Right here. Thanks, Ben-Hur. You are a fink. You're the disgrace of all Rome. Oh, no, Lady Leela, no. You are not Ben-Hur. You are Julius Caesar in disguise. Uh, uh, I admit it. Why did you trick me? To obtain admission to your private boudoir. I know you hate generals. Not true. Some of my best friends are generals. Oh, let me be your best friend, Leela. No, Caesar. I will do anything for your favor. I will divorce Calpurnia. No, Caesar. I will divide all Gaul into three parts. No, Caesar. I will cross the Rubicon. You forget... I am consecrated to the goddess Vesta and to the tending of the sacred fire which burns in her temple. Oh, consecrate yourself to me, Leela. We can go far together. The goddess will release you. She will? She has before. Ask her, Leela. Tell her the truth. Vesta respects love. Oh, I'm afraid. Are you worth it, Caesar, to give up everything for you? Oh, I am, Leela. Now... I will reveal the truth. I am not Julius Caesar disguised as Ben-Hur. I am Ben-Hur disguised as Julius Caesar, pretending to be Julius Caesar disguised as Ben-Hur. Uh, what? Well, I, 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 I'll put it another way. If anybody asks the real Ben-Hur to stand up, I will stand up. Oh, I, you overcome me. Oh, go. I will call the goddess on our CB, and I must be alone for the sacred ritual. There's another one. That's Sergeant Leela Tibbet. Shoot her quick. 10 cc. And hold on to her. Ah, that's two. One more to go. Ben 
say no more. Gentlemen of the house, I will fight for this mill on the beaches. I will fight in the cities of England, the towns, and the hamlets of our blessed isle. Will the right honorable member, Mr. Clive Hammer, yield? No, Mr. Disraeli, I will not yield. Will the right honorable member yield for a question? For a question only, Mr. Disraeli. Tell the house how much this canal of yours... The Suez Canal, sir. Tell the house how much this Suez Canal, for which you so eloquently plead... Will it cost Her Majesty's government? One hundred thousand pounds. What? One hundred thousand pounds. You have the audacity, Mr. Hammer, to ask Her Majesty's government to squander one hundred thousand pounds on a fly-by-night speculation called the Suez Canal? I do, sir. I do not ask. I demand for England. This happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in a silver sea, we must own the Suez Canal. Well done, Clive. Bravo! Uh, thanks, Mr. Disraeli. Your heckling came at just the right moment, but the house entirely on my side. Yes, yes, it did. I admit it. Without false modesty, I am a brilliant politician. You are the greatest of us all. No, 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 no. I'm not your equal. I shall be prime minister to Her Majesty someday. But you will always be the real power behind the throne. You flatter me, sir. I only pay just you. Now... How about grilled bones at Tattersall's? My Rolls Royce is waiting outside. Oh, Mr. Disraeli. Another treat like the ones we had when we were schoolboys together. Grilled bones with barbecue sauce. With what? Is that something new? Yes, of course. We don't have it yet. I know where to get some. You go ahead. I'll join you in the rolls in a minute. <laughs> Number three, Corporal Hammer. Grab him. Shoot him. Uh, all right. Now we'll need three stretchers to haul them to General Harp. So there they sprawled in General Harp's office. Private Nathan Riley, Sergeant Layla Tibbet, and Corporal Clive Hammer. They were in their hospital graves. They were torpid with sodium thiomorphate. The big office had been cleared and blazed with lights. It was lined with General Harp's experts from espionage, counter-espionage, security, and intelligence. When Captain Edsel saw the steel-faced, ruthless man awaiting him and his patients, he was frightened. Uh, what? What's all this, sir? My experts want to have a talk with you. With, with, with me, General? I, I thought you wanted the patients from Ward J. And you. Didn't occur to you that I mightn't buy your disappearance bluff, eh? But it's not a bluff, sir. It, 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 you can ask anyone at St. Albans. The staff still isn't talking, Captain. The General has nothing but your story. That's so. I'll spell it out for you. The war is going badly. We've had intelligence leaks that have been disastrous. I got my experts together, and we agree that Ward J may be the source. Oh, no, no General, no. no. And, and maybe you've been paid off to cover up, you and the St. Albans staff. But they do disappear. They do. It isn't a bluff or a story. They, they Work just... him over, gentlemen. My name is Edward Edsel. America is my nation. St. Albans is my dwelling place. And heaven is my destination. Has he broken yet? No, General. What are they using? Truth serum, sir. Tell them to try LSD inhibition release. That's against the law, sir. For Pete's sake, forget the law. We're fighting a war for civilization. Roger, General. Edward Ansel is my name. 
America's my nation. The army is my dwelling place, and hell is my destination. Well, Major. No break yet, General. Stubborn, isn't he? I don't think there's anything to break, sir. You think he's telling the truth? No, sir. I think he's suffering from an honest illusion. Then try the id and ego pressure point treatments. That'll break his delusions. General, we can't. It may wreck Ethel's mind forever. Don't be squeamish, Major. We've got to protect the American dream no matter what the price. Get to it. Break him. <laughs> Nation to darling destination. <laughs> it's no use, sir. We've brought Captain Edsel to the breaking point three times, and there is absolutely nothing to break. He can't tell you anything. All right, let him do. Tell them to go to work on the patients. General Harp, isn't that a bit much? Two sick men and a woman? Who says they're sick? This whole thing may be a cover-up for a covert operation in Ward J. And we've got to get to the bottom. I don't think your experts will cooperate, sir. What? They squeamish too? All right, I'll show them what a pro is. Come on, Major. Uh, sir, I, I, I don't think I... Call yourselves experts, eh? Where are those crocs? Oh, still out, eh? Major, give me three adrenaline shots. General Harp, you may be risking their lives. Come on, come on. What's a life when I'm protecting an ideal? Yes, sir. Here you are. Here we go. This one's Nathan Riley, eh? Come on, Riley. Wake up, boy. And tip it. Get with it, girl. Rise and shine, hammer. Everybody up. You're going to tell me what's going on in Ward J, understand? Good Lord. Captain Edsel was telling the truth. Captain Edsel, are you awake? Yes, sir. I, I, General, you saw them. You saw them disappear. I did. Captain Edsel, I... I apologize. I wish to do the handsome thing. Colonel Edsel, this is a field promotion for a discovery over and above the call of duty. You have just won the war for the American dream. <laughs> it's all very well to talk about a discovery that will win a war, provided you know what the discovery is and how to use it. Exactly what has been taking place? Where are the disappearing patients going and how do they get there? Can anyone follow them? Act three may tell us. It has been said that when one meets an unusual situation, one must handle it in an unusual manner. Unfortunately, General Harp is meeting the unusual situation of disappearing army patients in his most usual manner. He is reaching into the reserve of hardened and sharpened experts that America has become for more and more experts. All right, Colonel Edsel. You will sum up the medical aspects of War J for us. Uh, yes, General. Well, certain facts are obvious. This must be a new and fantastic syndrome brought on by the horrors of modern war. This new syndrome must involve something beyond strategy and tactics. What? Teleportation, General. Oh, what? Portation? Teleportation. The power of mind over space. You mean those crocs in Ward J think their disappearance? Uh, yes, sir. Evidently, combat shock, while destroying certain known powers of the mind, must develop other latent powers which were unknown up until now. You're sure of this? They can think themselves somewhere else. They must, General. They get food and sleep somewhere else. They never need it in Ward J. That's right, Major. Where do they get food and sleep? 
I want our intelligence to check. Well, our man might simply be going home, sir. They do get homesick, General. Right. Good suggestion. I want security to check. Family, wives, sweethearts, homes of every one of these crocs. Let the FBI handle that, but under my command. Right, General. Now, here's the procedure I've worked out. That's all. You will set up extra beds in Ward J. I'll send in experts to live there and observe. Can do, General. But, uh... We'll have to work fast, sir. They seem to be returning to Ward J less and less frequently. In the beginning, they would come and go almost every day. Now they seem to be staying away for weeks and months. My experts will find out what they're doing fast. I hope so, sir. The experts hustled. Security checked. Intelligence probed. The tension increased. General. Any reports, Major? Yes, sir. All negative. Damn. Security reports not one strange case of unexpected appearance has taken place anywhere in America. Intelligence reports the enemy has no such cases. Maybe they're keeping it secret, too. I'm sure they'd try, General. This is all brand new. We've got to get specialists to handle it. We've got to develop new tools. General, uh, excuse my breaking in like this, sir. Yeah. Our first lead. One of your experts in Ward J asked for the help of another expert. Hmm? Uh, if you've got him... I've got them all. What's he want? A, a, a lapidary. You mean an expert in precious stones? Yes, sir. What the devil for? He picked up a reference to a precious stone. He's a personnel specialist, and he can't relate it to anything in his experience. Now that I approve of. A job for every man and every man on the job. What? Kind of a stone. It's some kind of diamond nobody's ever heard of. A Jim Brady type. A Jim Brady type diamond? General, we've got it. Your experts delivered. And you won't believe it. Easy, Colonel Major, one at a time. What have you got? The archaeologist identified Jim Brady at once. Diamond Jim Brady. The Diamond was a nickname. Yes. He was a historic person who'd been famous in little old New York sometime between Governor Peter Stavisant and Governor Fiorella LaGuardia. That's ages ago. Uh, who'd the name come from in War J? Private Nathan Riley. And where'd he get it? We don't know. He's not a former history student, is he? Uh, no, sir. I, uh... I, I'm afraid to say this. There's no way he could have gotten it except if... Uh, if? If what? Well, if it's something bigger than teleportation. What could be bigger than teleportation? Time travel. Time travel? You mean that's where they're going to? Somewhere back in time? Yes, sir. They're going somewhere back in time. How? How? We don't know, General. And maybe that's why they're not coming back. They like it better there. You mean time travel is here. Not discovered through expert research by qualified physicists? Oh, no, sir. It's come as a plague, a disease of the war, a combat injury to ordinary men. Do you realize the colossal significance? We could send an army back in time and win the war before it started. We could protect the American dream of poetry and beauty and art from barbarism without ever endangering it. Yes, sir. If, uh, if we could find out how they do it. That's the point. Those crocs can't communicate the secret of the miracle. It's for us to find the key. We'll need advanced specialists, a cerebral mechanist, a cyberneticist, an autonomist, and a first-rate philosophic historian. They'll go into Ward J, and they won't come out until they've learned the technique of time travel. The first three experts were easy to draft from other war departments. But there was some trouble locating a first-rate historian until Alcatraz cooperated with the Army and released me. Uh, temporarily, from my sentence. Me, Harry Scrim. 
I was professor of philosophic history at Stanford until I spoke my mind about Harp's war for the American dream. That got me the 20 years. But I'm still contemptuous of you and your war, General. Mm. Never forget that. Then why'd you agree to come, Scrim? Well, I was intrigued by the problem of Ward J. But I'm not an expert. In this benighted nation of specialists, I'm the last singing grasshopper. Major, get me an entomologist. Uh, don't bother, I'll translate. You're a nest of ants, all working and specializing for what? We're fighting to preserve poetry and culture and the finer things in life. Which means you're fighting to preserve me. That's what I've devoted my life to. And what do you do with me? Put me in jail. You were convicted of disloyal criticism. I was convicted of believing in my American dream. Having a mind of my own. Don't let's waste time arguing. Let me have all those expert reports and lock me up in Ward J. I've got to talk fast, General. You're running out of time. All the while I was in Ward J, only three came back. They're all disappearing for keeps. Go ahead, go ahead. I want to give you the clues to something so fantastic, it'll need all your fine edge to cut into it. Now listen. Mm. Nathan Riley goes back in time to the turn of the 20th century. There he lived the life of his fondest dreams. He's a big-time gambler, friend of Diamond Jim Brady. He wins money because he always knows the outcome of events in advance. Such as? Truman to win the election for president. Corbett to win the heavyweight title from John L. Sullivan. He makes money investing in an auto company Henry Ford is starting. That mean anything to you? Not without a sociological analyst. I have more clues. Leela Tibbet escapes into the Roman Empire, where she lives the life of her dreams as a vestal virgin plus a femme fatale. Every man adores her. Julius Caesar, Savonarola, the 20th Legion, Ben-Hur. Well, you see the fallacy? No. She also smokes cigarettes and uses Wh a CB radio. Well? Clive Hammer escapes into 19th century England, where he's a member of Parliament and a friend of Benjamin Disraeli, who takes him out in his Rolls Royce for spare ribs with barbecue sauce. You know what a Rolls Royce was? No. It was an automobile. So? General, this is a bigger discovery than teleportation or time travel. What? This can be the salvation of mankind. Those shock victims have been bombed into something so staggering, it's no wonder your experts couldn't understand it. <laughs> what, 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 what could be bigger than time travel, Professor? Listen, listen. Truman didn't run for president until the middle of the 20th century. Riley couldn't have been Diamond Jim Brady's friend and bet on Truman at the same time. John L. Sullivan and Henry Ford don't go together either. Riley's time travel is full of anachronism. What? Leila Tibbet couldn't have been her for a lover because he never existed. He was a fictional character. She's lying. And cigarettes weren't invented in Roman times. More anachronism. Automobiles weren't developed until long after Disraeli died. He couldn't have taken Clive Hammer for a ride in a Rolls Royce. They're all lying. No. They've discovered how to turn dreams into reality. And they know how to enter them. And live a happy dream life. By heaven, Harp, this is your American dream. It's miracle working, immortality, creation, mind over matter. It must be studied, explored, given to the world so that everybody can learn. Will you do it, Scrim? I can't. I'm non creative. You need a poet. An artist who understands the creative process and practices it. A poet? 
Are you serious? Certainly. Don't you know what a poet is? You've been telling us for five years that this war is being fought to save the poet. Don't be sarcastic, Scrim. Send a poet into war, Jay. He's the only man who can learn how they do it. A poet is half doing it himself anyway. He's the only man who can tell us and teach us this miracle. But hurry up. Time is running out. I believe you're right. Yes, General. Get me a poet. Right away, General. Trying, General. Still trying, General. <laughs> Attempting to locate your poet, sir. Still locating your poet, General. <laughs> Bound to be a poet somewhere, General. There used to be lots around. Yeah, that's right. Used to be. What are you laughing at, Slim? If you'll be patient and wait, General. Sure, wait, General. <laughs> wait, you sad fool. Wait. Wait for your poet. America sorted feverishly through its millions of hardened and sharpened experts, its special tools to defend the dream of beauty and poetry and the better things in life. General Yubi Harp waited, not understanding the endless delay, the hopeless search, or why Harry Scrim laughed and laughed at this final fatal disappearance. I'll be back shortly. It's not a happy story, and it's a story of an unhappy future which we hope will never come to pass. But there is one consolation. Now at least we know where the little man who wasn't there goes when he goes away. To a time that never was, of course. There are moments when I dream of going there, too. Don't we all? The people in this dream included Robert Dryden, Leon Janney, Ian Martin, Martha Greenhouse, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear